So our scriptures this weekend give us the opportunity to take a look at vocation, at freedom, and vengeance. So first, vocation. Um, <clears throat> believe it or not, everyone has a vocation. Now, you may be living a specific vocation like marriage or holy orders, but everyone has a vocation, a call from God. And I want to share just a little of my call because our first reading today talks about two characters, Elijah and Elisha. And that can be a little confusing because it's kind of like talking about Bob and Rob. Their names sometimes get confused, but Elijah is a prophet. And Elijah's a little depressed because he's concerned that there's no one to succeed him. There's no one that's going to take up the mantle of prophecy in Israel after he's gone. And so God promises to Elijah that he will send another prophet. And so he sends Elijah to Elisha, who is plowing with his oxen. And the way that Elijah calls Elisha to consider God's vocation for him is by placing his vestment, his cloak over him. Well, for me, uh, my vocation really started with a boring Friday night. Um, my buddy Troy and I, at the age of 16, were driving around Lake Charles, Louisiana, trying to find somebody to do something with, and no one was home. All of our buddies were on this youth retreat at the youth minister's house. And so, like any 16-year-old, we decided that we would do something really cool. We'd crash the retreat. And so we did. We showed up at the youth minister's house and walked in, even though we hadn't signed up for the retreat. And she was gracious. She invited us in. She called our parents, made sure it was okay that we stayed. And so we thought, cool, we get to hang out with our buddies. And so, of course, the retreat was a typical high school retreat. It was focused on what's next after high school. And Troy and I already knew our plans. Troy was going to be a writer. I was going to be a physicist. We had a great plan. We knew the whole route. It was fabulous. And so, during the retreat, it was a little shocking to me that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the question came to me, what about priesthood? And I did what any typical 16-year-old would do. I pretended like it never happened. But it wouldn't stop. It wouldn't go away. That question just kept coming back to me again and again and again. And so I finally went and talked with a priest, and he encouraged me to pray and encouraged me to keep thinking about it. And I did keep thinking about it, and it kept coming back. Now, it took me a long time. I'm kind of a slow learner, so it took me a long time to finally decide to go to a seminary. So I was about 19 when I chose to go to a college seminary and explore that call a little more deeply. And like I said, I'm a slow learner, so it took me another five years before I could definitively say that I believed that God was calling me to be a priest, that I had the ability to be a priest, and that I could do it with joy. And that last one was the critical link. If I didn't believe that I could do it with joy, I didn't want to do it because I've seen enough unhappy priests in my life, and that is the worst betrayal of the gospel I can imagine. Because to be a minister of the gospel, to minister God's sacraments and not enjoy what you're doing is a travesty. Now it's similar, I think, for many of you who are married. You know, when someone asks you, when did you first know that you were gonna marry your spouse? You know, for some of you, maybe you had love at first sight. It's possible, it happens, but often, it grows in community. You know, you have to see other people living marriage in a beautiful way to imagine that you would even want to do that. You have to see other marriages that are healthy and happy in order to be attracted to that call, to that vocation. And that's true of every vocation. You know, Elijah helped Elisha to hear his call. And every vocation comes from a community. This parish community has called a number of young men to priesthood over the years since it was founded in 1956. But you know, it's been a while. Father Christopher Manning, who's in Chattanooga right now, is the last priest who was ordained from our parish. And so it's time for one of you to listen, to hear God's call, because someday I want to retire, and I need someone to replace me. And somewhere out there, I know there is someone who God is calling. I don't know your name yet, but you can always talk to me after Mass. But it's important that as a whole community, 
that we pray for vocations, both to priesthood and to marriage, because we need both of those sacraments for a healthy community. We need healthy marriages and healthy families so that we can call healthy men to the priesthood. We need that lived example of God's love in our community for a vocation to develop and mature. And so really all of us share in a responsibility of calling forward vocations. Now you may be thinking, well, I'm, I'm not married and I don't wanna be a priest. Fine, there's still a call. And that's what we hear about in the second reading. St. Paul is talking to the Galatians about their call, their call from baptism. Because by baptism, all of us are called to follow Christ. And we meet Christ through this community. That's why it is so important that we continue to develop a community of hospitality that welcomes everyone in, that invites people to come and meet the Lord Jesus. It's because our freedom is not a freedom from. Christian freedom is never just someone who says, you're not the boss of me. That's not Christian freedom. Christian freedom is a freedom for, a freedom for service, a freedom for living out our baptismal call to draw others to the person of Christ. Now, of course, the challenge with freedom is sometimes we use our freedom poorly. Sometimes we misuse the freedom that we've been given. And that's where vengeance comes in. You know, this past week has been a pretty wild week. If you've been on social media at all, you've probably seen a lot of pretty vicious conversations. And that's why St. Paul also reminds the Christian community, if you go on biting and tearing one another to pieces, you will end in mutual destruction. It's so important for us, even the word sarcasm, it's a Greek word, it literally means to bite flesh, sarks and chasm, to bite flesh. And when we bite and tear one another to pieces, we betray the call that we've received from Christ. We betray what we're supposed to do with our freedom. And it is tempting, that's, that's where the vengeance comes in. You know, when we see people that disagree with us, when we see people that are anti-Christian, people that do not like the church or do not like what the church teaches, it is tempting to want ill things to happen to another. Just like in the gospel today, James and John want to call down fire from heaven on those that don't welcome them. And Jesus says no. In fact, not only does he say no, he rebukes the apostles. That's a pretty strong word. He rebukes them. And there's some manuscripts of this gospel that were not included in scripture but are instructive. In one of the manuscripts, there's an additional passage where Jesus says, I came to save souls, not destroy them. That's the heart of Christ. Christ came into the world not to make one group superior over another. Christ came into the world not to alienate people from each other. Christ came into the world to save souls. And as Christians, our call is the same. In fact, one of the biggest obstacles to belief for people who are not Christian is the way professed Christians sometimes behave. When we betray the gospel by how we act, we need to go back and remember the words that Jesus said, that we are to love those who would be our enemies, that we are to pray for our persecutors. Now, I know many of us are very excited that there is now legal protection for unborn children, and that is a wonderful, wonderful victory but it is not the end of our call. Our call is to promote the dignity of all human life. And so now we need to look for additional ways to support women in crisis pregnancies. Now we need to look for additional ways to promote the dignity of human life by helping those in poverty, by helping those who would be tempted to want an abortion so that they see the love of the Christian community coming forward so that they experience Christians in the world not as those who stand in judgment, but as those who stand beside them in love. That's our call. And so as we reflect on these scriptures this weekend, we know that God indeed is reaching out to each of us. He's inviting us to share in his love for the world, 
He's asking us to use the freedom that we've been given in Christ for some purpose. And he's challenging us to make sure that our lives are lived with authenticity so that the witness we give in the world is a witness to the love of God for all souls.